Good afternoon. Hello. Let's try this again. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Hey, hey. hey. There you go. Hi. Um, as thanks to this awesome introduction that makes me blush every time because I didn't write it. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, Sarah, for having me, the Department of English as well, and the IHR. Right, this has been a really awesome experience, and I'm happy to have this chance to share my work with you. Uh, I will warn you ahead of time that I talk fast. Um, I've been assured that I have some time to get through these slides. However, that will not reduce the rate at which I speak the words. <laughs> I just talk fast. So. Uh, hopefully, uh, if you have questions, um, just write them down as we go along, and I'll definitely come back and address them when we're done. All right? So, here we go. So I need to talk about joy, y'all. Uh, specifically, black joy as black digital practice. I get that in this time, of Baroque Reconstruction, and yes, I'm gonna copyright that, um, where a casually racist, misogynist, and xenophobic administration seeks to restore the halcyon days of white supremacist America, our efforts and our energies need to be focused on resistance to oppression, as well as to the increasing commodification of our daily digital lives. My social media feeds, which were already overburdened with images of black death at the hands of the state, are now also awash with news items I once would have expected to read in satirical spaces like The Onion, leaving my, me trying to get through my feeds looking somewhat like the gentleman in this picture. <laughs> so back to my title. Black, joy, and digital have an uneasy relationship, one which I hope to trouble during this presentation. Practicing the digital has been read as consumption, as labor, and as the political. And these analyses depend upon values our society and our culture assign to the digital, which from these perspectives seem like, make it seem like a joyless space indeed. Joel Dienerstein, in writing on the Western technocultural matrix, which he argues for as a mythology of American culture, outlines American beliefs in progress, in modernity, and in the future which when mapped onto information and communication technologies can be understood as productivity, efficiency, work, and profit. When digital practice does achieve joy, it's meekly argued for as play, which is largely bereft of social or economic capital and relegated to memes, to the lulls, to video games, and sometimes to art installations. Before you protest, because I know there's some digital scholars in here. Think of the digital manifestations for each of these examples. Memes are often anonymously generated, right? And their generation is not considered a productive activity, regardless of what April Rain has to say about Oscar So White. The lulls has become the domain of anarchists and trolls, while gamers still labor under perceptions of Cheeto dust, unemployment, and delayed adolescence. Joy could also be understood as an antidote to stress or a palliative. I don't think enough attention is paid to the ways in which online folk deploy multimedia palliatives to relieve our collective social malaise. So skip over the big words. These palliatives could be simple as a like button to show allegiance, right? But also can arrive as GIFs or GIFs, depending on how you feel about that pronunciation, <laughs> cat videos, baby animal slideshows, a personal favorite, or unicorn images. My wife's favorite is the one with the unicorn with the knife strapped to its horn, right? <laughs> to address and counteract symptoms of OIEDS, or AIDS, I'm sorry, OIDS, Online Induced Emotional Distress. Don't cut, I just was fooling around. I just, <laughs> don't write that one down. In online blackness, I could gesture to the phrase black girl magic as emblematic of black joy, but fortunately, or perhaps unfortunately, the hashtag's creator has actually preempted my criticism. Twitter power user La Peebs, or at the PBG, wrote a few months ago on the phrases capture by respectability politics adherence. And they use it to digitally represent appropriate black womanhood. So think of Lupita getting uh, an award at the Oscars or other similar spaces where celebration is limited to people who achieve certain aesthetic, political, and civic goals, right? And in the process, Lapeeves argues, they preempted and elided her intended celebration of black women from diverse walks of life and life experiences. So she wrote, Hood black girls got magic too, right? Black girls that do hair in their kitchen, disabled black girls, lesbian black girls, fat black girls, poor black girls, black girls who are relaxers and weave, which I think is important. Black girls that are single moms, black girls that haven't figured out how to blend their makeup. 
black girls that are incarcerated, trans black girls, teenage black girls, uneducated and under undereducated black girls, black girls that work low paying jobs, and black girls that present as masculine, etc. So from this, I, I feel like um, black girl magic is not necessarily representative of a heterogeneous joy across blackness. It's limited to a specific type of joy that only certain people can, can avail themselves of. There's a growing school of black studies and critical black media scholars who wish to erase joy altogether. Okay, that's an overstatement, but I'm dramatic. This works for me, right? They argue that if there is joy to be found in blackness, it should be properly located in, it, in blackness resistance to social death, right? A foundational concept for a theory called Afro-pessimism. Defined as the denial of political life in the Western civic project, from this perspective, everything associated with black bodies and the black experience becomes resistance for assimilation to hegemonic culture is tantamount to accepting death. Let me be clear, resistance in and of itself does not make a life worth living. While racism, and this is me talking actually, me let me tell you something. While racism and white supremacist ideology define the milieus in which I move through, they are not the entirety of my existence. Resistance alone is not capable of creating the surplus resources necessary to have a full life. These can only be created in moments where we are allowed to dream, to dance, to cry, or to feel joy. So, I've tried to contextualize joy through lazy, sloppy definitions. I will admit to that, but you know, try not to hold it against me. Today I'm using joy as shorthand for the term jouissance, which I will probably stumble over at some point. So if I just say joy, when you see that word on the screen, don't hold it against me. It originates from Lacan, but whose meanings I'm deriving from both Barth and Leotard. In keeping with their definitions, jouissance, which has been translated poorly as bliss, or overwhelming pleasure is not restricted to joy, to pleasure, or even to celebration, although it contains those things. I mentioned play briefly, but jouissance isn't all play either, although play can be a component of it. Play has been described as having limited immediate function, right? even as it is understood as being important for neurological, emotional, and social development. It's often described as frivolous and lighthearted, but can also be dangerous, aggressive or destabilizing. If you think of cyberbullying and its, and its offline component, cyberbullying, I mean bullying, sorry. This last, offers, this last part, the destabilization, offers a window into both Sarah Florini's work and my own research on Black Twitter. In marking linguistic and cultural wordplay on Black Twitter practice, we both refer to the ways in which meanings and identify, identities are destabled profitably and recentered on Blackness through these digital and discursive strategies. I do not believe that our use of the word play was accidental. Burkhart, an animal psychologist, animal social psychologist, and writing on animal play, argues that play not only originates from, but creates surplus resources that may be useful on subsequent occasions. So when you talk Black Lives Matter, my argument has been for the last few years that Black Lives Matter would not be possible without the ratchetry and foolishness that is promoted on Black Twitter, right? That's, it's where it gets its energy from. And it's from this perspective that I wanna discuss the ways in which Black informational identity, a creative, passionate, often joyful practice, can create surplus resources for dealing with the unfun parts of life. So when using joy, I'm calling for the perceptions of Jewissance and Black digital practice. I want to explain a little bit more about how I got here because it definitely wasn't as facile as I've made it out to be in these few sides. But to do so, I have to go a little bit further down the rabbit hole of French structuralism. So you're going to get more, sorry. To make the connection between jouissance as a structure of feeling and its enactment in, dig in digital practice. I have beef, which is not surprising to anyone who knows me. I have beef with a vast swath of internet and new media research into minority use of the internet. Their analyses of black digital practice leave me wanting. This may be because I believe that political economy, one of the more common uh, analytical methods for understanding digital practice, does not do well analyzing cultural commodities as artifacts or audience commodities as cultural collectivities. Critical political economy offers possibilities, but its focus on oppression and resistance still lingers upon labor, the state, and the public sphere, leaving cultural aspects behind. From a communications perspective, political economy interprets relationships between media institutions, structures of production, and the state. 
A political e economic analysis of digital media would examine the social production of digitally mediated meaning, focusing on linkages between new media, capitalist development, and state power, in addition to the other things I, recent, I just mentioned. Moscow contends that political economy is a study of control and survival in social life, a definition I think works really well for this argument, and which unironically leaves little room for linkages between desire and activity. So my alternative is libidinal economy. As defined by Leotard, it describes the emotional impulses and desires powering the machinations of political economy. Here, jouissance refers to enjoyment of use, of the seeking of pleasures and desires, of play and of climax, particularly the explosive climax. Right? Frank Wilderson uh, notes that libidinal economy is linked not only to forms of attraction, affection, and alliance, but also, as mentioned earlier, to aggression, destruction, and the violence of lethal construction. When you see lynching photos, right, that is a depicting a pleasurable moment for the people involved in the picture, then the body parts that are remaining in the picture are not quite having the same experience. Right? Leotard argues that political economy tries to foreclose pleasure, claiming that if a thing cannot be exchanged, for then how does, one, how does one value love or passion? Don't mention Valentine's Day, okay? That doesn't count. Right. Mm -hmm. If a thing cannot be exchanged, it has no value and does not exist on the market. But their lack of exchange value in this regime does not negate their existence nor their affect, or their effect, my bad. From this position, you can see that polit political economy focusing on relationships between the production, distribution, and consumption of resources often overlook human consciousness and awareness through its focus on economic survival. My argument for libidinal economies of digital practice also draws from black feminist epistemology and their grounding of black women's bodies and lived experiences as a source of knowledge. Specifically, I'm engaging with Joan Morgan's Black Feminist <coughs> Politics of Pleasure, where she asks how desire, agency, and black women's engagement with pleasure can be developed into a viable theoretical paradigm. While doing so, she argues for black female interiority as the broad range of feelings, desires, yearning, erotic and otherwise, that were once deemed necessarily private by the politics of silence. I answer Morgan's call by presenting something I call black online interiority, right, as a way of understanding how black embodiment and jouissance vivifies online experiences and digital practice. One application of libidinal economy to race and racial ideology comes from Frank Wilderson, a leading proponent of Afro-pessimism. He identifies anti-blackness as the libidinal economy of American modernity, writing that blackness overdetermines the embodiment of impossibility, incoherence, and incapacity. He continues by saying the devaluation and reduction of the human body to its potential for labor and objectification is clearest when the body is black. And Wilderson's Afro-pessimism rests upon the argument that blackness is a structural position of non-communicability in the face of all other positions. This can also be understood as black life lived in a social death, exterior to civil society. Now, I acknowledge the power of Afro-pessimism as a theoretical construct, but I fail to see its productive application for investigating the passions and liveliness of black Twitter, or digital practice specifically, and black life in general. Even though Jared Sexton argues powerfully that Afro-pessimism by necessity includes an affirmation of blackness, he then qualifies that blackness by saying it's an affirmation of pathological being and should be seen as a refusal to distance oneself from blackness and a valorization of minor differences that may bring one closer to health, life, or sociality. But that's not enough for me. I don't think joy is the valorization of minor, minor difference. This claim deposits me in the camp of the Afro-optimist, which isn't as happy as it may sound. <laughs> Succinct, succinctly stated, which is interesting given the five syllable words I've been using so far, Afro-optimism is a position that black life, and I'm quoting here, which is surely to say life as black thought, is to say thought, is irreducibly social, that moreover, Black life is lived in political death, or that it is lived, if you will, in the burial ground of the subject by those who, insofar as they are not subjects, are also not in the interminable, as opposed to the last analysis, 
Social Death Bound. Frank Moulton, I love the way he writes, I just can't copy it, right? Our aim, he continues, even in the face of the brutally imposed difficulties of black life is cause for celebration. This is not because celebration is supposed to make us feel good or make us feel better, though there would be nothing wrong with that. It is, rather, because the cause for celebration turns out to be the condition of possibility of black thought, which animates the black operations that will produce this absolute overturning, the absolute turning of this motherfucker out. Right? So for me, if Afro-pessimism is structural non-communicability, then black Twitter offers overwhelming evidence from my perspective that refutes the stance of Afro-pessimism, both culturally and digitally, through practice, discourse, and ethos, in many ways fulfilling the tenets of Afro-optimism. Right? Which again, is not celebration just to be happy, but it is the celebration of the possibility of black thought. How then, Sorry, I couldn't resist this. <laughs> How then does Afro-optimism, the libidinal economy of black life, relate to digital practice? Information technology has its own libidinal economy, which can be understood as techno-rationalist, even as it incorporates mass media's desires of address, availability, and access. Ooh, I forgot to put my notes here, so I'm going to make this up as I go along. At Marcuse defines Afro, I'm sorry, Marcuse defines techno-rationalism as a ready apprehension of opaque facts and passively exact quantitative terms. And the workman will do his best to avoid quasi-personal interpretations of observed phenomena, right, which may sway the, the types of perceptions available to proceed in modern society. Right? Uh, I make this connection between Afro-optimism and uh, black digital practice because I think if you understand black Twitter or if you even watch black Twitter, quasi-personal interpretations of observed phenomena is what black Twitter is all about. I'm not saying that other people don't do this type of emotional affective labor or practice when they're uh, working online, but black Twitter has been celebrated for the ways in which it does so. And from for me, this this series of arguments and warrants works together to make apparent that libidinal economy makes uh, shows deeper influences of libidinal motives on rational and efficient digital processes and practices. Whew. Let's hope I didn't forget any other notes. So, I've done a lot of talking and theorizing. Let's start winding this down by tiptoeing towards examining black joy in action. Here's example one. Actually, it's example all, but you know, I, would, I had dreams for this presentation. On January 5th, 2017, Yahoo Business forgot to use spell check. <laughs> They posted a tweet. This is the fun part about doing, talking about blackness in digital spaces. I get to be the explainer. So they posted a tweet that ostensibly referenced the Trump administration's desire to ramp up military presence. There are a number of possible reactions to this, and the next few slides may help explain how I get over it. <laughs> I will let y'all read this. But I think you, I'm pretty sure you've seen this before. I have on screen one of the most cited passages in African American studies, Du Bois' description of double consciousness. I've used it in some form or another across my entire research stream as I seek to, to warrant black identity in online spaces, but not always for the same reasons. Originally, I employed this epigraph to illustrate how black folk were always already deeply enmeshed in the kind of virtual existence and alienation that cyber culture theorists of the early 2000s were so ready to proclaim as that new new. I now see it slightly differently. Double consciousness serves as my warrant for blackness as a discursive online identity flitting back and forth in the virtual space between a black communal and a white supremacist categorical context. Today, I want to try to push forward to a third reading of double consciousness as an evocation of black jouissance versus something that Barth calls plaisir or pleasure. In Erotics of Reading, Brian Ott helps me to offer this libidinal approach to encountering media, drawing, drawing deeply from Barth's The Pleasure of the Text. Barth describes author-centered media as the work, which is consumed by audiences, and the work privileges the signified Although, they, and although it allows for the possibility of a plural signified, it is always a limited plural because the work closes down writing, closes down textuality, and perpetuates the illusion that it is finished. Directing the reader towards a prescribed meaning, one which is comfortably linked to a consistence of the self and of the subject. 
this consumption, this consistency, is plaisir in Barth's words, which can be understood as linked and understood as pleasure linked to subjectivity and cultural enjoyment and identity to the cultural enjoyment of the identity. So earlier, and I'm, this is not putting Bambi on blast, Bambi and I were, were going back and forth talking about a website that we love called Very Smart Brothers. And we were both talking about our comfort in reading Very Smart Brothers. And this is the, I promised I would talk about this later. We both derive pleasure from the ways in which Very Smart Brothers helps us to be interpolated, hailed by a particular black communal identity, right? So, Ott argues that plaisir is the pleasure of identifying with and submitting to a text socially accepted meanings Dominant, he says, but I argue that this can happen for minority communities as well, and as such involves conforming to the dominant ideology and the subjectivity it proposes. He does argue that while media texts are a source of pleasure, they can also be a source of displeasure. Uh, those of you who hate watch know exactly what I mean. When texts are read or decoded from an oppositional perspective, readers recognize and resist the ideological hail to subjectivity, which destroys plaisir or pleasure. While oppositional reading can be pleasurable, unfortunately, Ott contends, the activity of doing so has become work because of the implied resistance in displacing hegemony and resisting the hail. To illustrate, he offers an example that I'm sure many of you have encountered as media scholars, your friends and your family asking, do you even enjoy media? All you do is criticize it, <laughs> right? Uh, the resistance that we scholars love to highlight and instances of media consumption is our enforcement of a particular kind of subjectivity, shaped by our positionality, rather than that of the heterogeneous audience. And I have here in my notes, see also professional black women's love of ratchet television. Right? Ott continues. Jouissance, however, goes beyond pleasure. Right? To understand it, though, you have to kind of walk with Bars where he says, the text is slight, is different from the work in that the text removes the author-centered perspective of the work, right? Uh, it removes the author, it conceptualizes dis discourse as a multi-dimensional space in which a variety of writings, none of them original, blend and clash as a tissue of operations, of, I'm sorry, of quotations. It also locates the reader as the space on which all quotations that make up a writing are inscribed without any of them being lost. Finally, Jewissance is still closely tied to subjectivity, but it does, throw, does so through unsettling, through play, limited immediate impact, remember? Through play uh, about with the reader's historical, cultural, and psychological assumptions and the consistency of his taste. It is a re system of reading through which the subject, instead of establishing itself, is lost. So let me take a step back before I jump to the obvious conclusion. Double consciousness, then, can be seen as an ongoing tension between jouissance and plaisir. It's not as simple as saying that submitting to the hegemony of white racial ideology is pleasurable, however. Moreover, the experience of blackness is not exempt from hegemony. How could it be? And could be interpolated through plaisir as well. I argue thusly because I see respectability politics, in particular, as trying to inframe a specific kind of black identity as hegemonically comfortable for the economic and social gain of one group, the black middle class. This aspirational discourse is technologized through the moder modernist strategies of aesthetic, linguistic, and physical hygiene, and technical hygiene. If you think about the ways, so I listen, unfortunately, to uh, hip hop music. It's not unfortunate, I love it. Right, but one of my favorite songs is a song called Down in the DM. Mm -hmm. mm, Ashley's smiling, so. <laughs> I, I, you may not have heard it, but one of the verses revolves around the, the rapper, his name is Yo Gotti, um, who talks about his pleasure and distaste in the ways in which he is addicted to going through his direct messages on Instagram and Twitter, because that's where he does his assignations, the ways he finds the women that he wants to hook up with, or more accurately, the way he lusts and for the pleasure or to be pleasured by the women in his direct messages. Right? The communal identity that Du Bois refers to in his epigraph, itself beholden to uplift politics and respectability, because we're not gonna let him off the hook for that, should be more properly articulated as a communal heterogeneous black identity. This heterogeneity, collaborative and multiplicitous, can be understood as the irreducible sociality of black life. In other words, double consciousness describes the tensions involved in the pleasure of being black 
and the despair of, over the position of being black in American culture. An epistemological position allowing for hope despite the pathological assignation of social death in the Western polity. So, we're almost there. Ott argues that a erotics of reading is a critical practice, a perspective or attitude, not a critical methodology. The attitude required involves three interwoven sensibilities, significance, cruising, and drifting. For significance, one begins with an appreciation of the plurality of writing, the mobile play of signifiers, with no possible reference to a fixed signified. The best part for me is he wrote this in 2003. He had no idea what Twitter was, mm -hmm. right? But this sounds, does this sound familiar to you as Twitter practice, right? To read a text for significance is to disperse its meaning instead of deciphering it. The hashtag fits this definition well. I described it previous, previously in my writing on Black Twitter as having as a triple signifying artifact. It marks the concept to be signified, the cultural context within which the tweet could be understood, and the call awaiting a response. Right? Further, it also offers multi more positions, the digital affordances of recall and archive, giving it a polysemic function far beyond its humble appearance. Cruising and drifting mark the audience's playful practice of assigning their own signification to the text, big T text. Cruising refers to invention, where readers experiment and create their own relationships, while drifting happens when readers do not respect the whole, treating discourses as unfinished and imposing ruptures upon their surfaces. Here, <laughs> Here, readers invent something different from the original intention, wandering through an imposed system. I see at replies and references as cruising, and quoted retweets as drifting. So let's return to our Big T text. A dominant reading, and here I'm, I'm pulling from Stuart Hall, a dominant reading of this text could see that this tweet as a technical publication error. Right. A negotiated reading could acknowledge that nigger was a typo, in the process noting that it could be read as offensive by certain sensitive identity politics having people. An oppositional reading would reject this text. <laughs> An oppositional reading would reject this text, seeing it as implicit evidence of the bigotry of the Trump administration and of the mainstream media, which allowed this tweet to be published in the first place, and you should be outraged. Barth, however, asks us to see this, see this particular tweet, well, not this particular tweet, but the text as the comical that does not make us laugh, the irony which does not subjugate. And I see that happening through Black Twitter joy. So I should have had this slide earlier when I talked about cruising, drifting, and significance, but this is as good a place as any. So I don't know how many of you recognize this particular GIF, GIF. Right? This is a black cult object, as my friend Kristen Warner loves to say. Only people in the know know what it is, but I will explain it to you because I am the black explainer. <laughs> All right. This is a hastily constructed example of the jouissance of black Twitter practice, but here goes. BuzzFeed was kind enough to explain this first GIF, claiming that it is one of the most popular memes of 2016. They found that it comes from a video of a 2009 rap freestyle battle, and the gentleman holding the red cup is a, it goes by the name of Reggie Sergile, S-E-R-G-I-L-E. -E. He is a rapper who goes uh, under the moniker of Conceited. He was battling in this cipher, and the GIF captures his reaction when his opponent, Jesse James, I'm sure that's not his real name, but hey, BuzzFeed didn't tell me, when his opponent tripped up over his words. The reaction was not converted to GIF form until 2015, but you know, on the internet, things live forever. And its popularity spiked in 2016, BuzzFeed argues, when viewers of the first presidential debate between Clinton and Trump <laughs> reacted to the moderators prompting the debaters to talk about race. Right? One of my constant delights in writing about black Twitter is its inventiveness and its kairos, its timeliness. Now that I've explained this reaction gift to you, it may seem trite to argue that black Twitter uses applying it to the nigger navy hashtag is an act of joy. I still giggle, however, when reading the captions. Come, come, come. Maybe if I do that. Oh, connection lost. You got that one. Let's see if I can get it up now. There we go. Uh, 
one of the hashtags, the hashtag participants assigned the gift to produce Liver Navy tweets. Um, while each image is a slightly different frame of the original GIF, there is enough similarity between them to understand that Sir Gile's performance of skepticism is for the reader and the tweet poster a pleasurable connection made between the image and the accompanying caption. Nigger Navy evoked black joy, offer, often performed through black cultural objects and recollections of lived experiences to ostensibly discuss naval warfare, institutions, and practice, but actually to darkly critique labor practices, social protocol, and etiquette, black parenting strategies, and much more. Although not depicted here, many tweets contextualize the hashtag with photos of black celebrities and black media culture, such as the gifts shown before, all mediated by the call and response functions of black Twitter hashtag practice. So from a libidinal economic perspective, black Twitter enacts jouissance or joy in the practice of articulating a joyful response, response to inadvertent racism, an empathetic yet critical take on black culture, signifying on something that originally had nothing to do with black culture. Most importantly for this presentation, while it could be read as resistance to social death, black joy instead allows us to appreciate the pleasure inherent in these responses, enabled through inventive creation and digital media affordances of media display and distribution, plus social media affordances for, uh, for, social media's affordances for sharing it with your friends, family, and occasionally white people. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments, sarcasm, irony. Yes, ma'am. So you know, Professor Dorothy. So many. Yes. Right? Yes. So many questions, ideas, insight. Um, one of the, the biggest, because I, I catch I catch what you're saying in, in the sense of like, hey, I know there's digital, like, okay, digital studies scholars. I see you, and I see your flaws. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just at CSCW, oh. like. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is computer supported the computer collaborative work, uh, cooperative work mm -hmm. conference, which those conference papers are worth more than most journal articles. In fact, I looked it up. It's, they're worth more than New Media and Society. The H factor is yep. significant, but a lot of these people are um, uh, come from an informatics background or human computer interaction, which is that I gather, I'm, I suppose that's my question that, that it's that is that political economy. Without calling it political. The techno rationalism, absolutely. Techno -rationalism. absolutely. Yeah. Extraordinary. And I was really struck. So, Joe Fishkai, I went to a great presentation, Marlon Twyman, young uh, black uh, social network researcher, computer scientist at Northwestern, okay. gave an incredible presentation about folks, use, uh, black editors and journalists' uses of Wikipedia as a place to, do, to, to create these obituaries. Yeah. You know, because you know they're not being allowed. There's no access to the you know newspapers and so forth for people who've been lost, and it's a space for mourning, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, he puts the computer scientist thing on it, right? Spin on it to reach that CSCW audience with like the the graphs and all this kind of stuff. He did a great job. Nobody challenged his work. There were no critical questions from the audience. After that, there was a young white researcher, also a very talented young computer scientist from Northeastern. And he was sort of uh, embedding um, this sort of affective theory along with social network analysis to show how certain tweets, groups of individuals, so if you're a police officer and you're on Twitter, you're more likely to belong to these, a Twitter network of other like-minded people who are gonna code the word thug, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In a certain way, yeah. as opposed to if you are like a young black rapper, or young black artist, and your networks are gonna code the word thug in a very different way. Right, I'm and bad. for people who study social networks and in particular use them to catch terrorists hmm. or whatever, um, those those meanings really matter. So everybody attacked the white research, hmm. but nobody challenged Marlon's work. Hmm. Even though I feel like Marlon's work, to me, I was like, this is what happens when we allow people of color to do work in their own communities. It's much more lucid, much more powerful. Mm -hmm. You know. So, um, so I suppose my question for you, after all that long thing, right? Because we're in these these similar communities, is how are we going to make this work legible to those informatics people? Mm -hmm. Because what are the chances that Marlon is going to, you know, continue to get support for his important work? 
I mean, even in the space, studying Wikipedia and creating social networks for you know police officers, mm -hmm. one of them gets funded and one of them doesn't, right? right? right. All the scientists were interested in what the white researcher had to say, but not what Marlon had to say, even though Marlon's was technically and theoretically superior work. Mm -hmm. So how are we going to, you know, I mean, we can be critical of them, but how are we going to make this meaningful to those informatics, you know, people? I've been struggling with that question since I got my PhD. My specialty is social informatics, right? And I've always taught it as critical cultural informatics, meaning that I refuse to rest on the idea that the social is what structures computational use in institutions, that there are cultural influences as well. So if you have a, a, um, a corporation say that powers a search engine, and most of your uh, engineers and coders are white, it's kind of interesting how uh, when you do image searches that people come up as gorillas when you're looking for black, black that gorillas are coded as black people and vice versa, mm -hmm. right? And so that, it, to me, I've always argued that there are racial problematics inherent in the lack of diversity in these spaces. That being said, I did time at Microsoft uh, last fall, right? And I gave a couple of presentations not necessarily as theoretically dense as this one because they wouldn't get it, right? But trying to talk about the idea of cultural competence as a mode for building collaborative spaces or social media platform went right over their head. And, and cultural competence is low-hanging fruit. It is low-hanging yeah. fruit, right? Super low-hanging fruit. And so I don't know. I mean, I keep trying to, to make sure that I keep my hand in with teaching those kind of courses. Um, and that's at most the best I can think of. Even, even that strategy is flawed because many departments, uh, I can definitely speak on Illinois and Iowa to a lesser extent about Michigan, don't see the value in talking about cultural competence for computational or information technologies. They just don't see it. Their thing is it must be quantitative and uh, readily opaque, right? Something that people can grab onto, like the, the white researcher you mentioned, that they have a connection with and they don't see themselves in a comfortable space. Here we go talking about disruption of subjectivity. They don't see themselves as being comfortable enough to comment on the problems inherent in the type of research that Marlon's doing. So I, my overall answer is I don't know. <laughs> but it's striking to me because what I see, I mean the irony of this, right, the right. layers, is that are we creating, because I can, I mean, right, like we've talked about this, who's doing work in the field, in internet studies? Mm -hmm. 50 people? Maybe. We know them all? Yep. Are we creating a separate strand, a separate intellectual discourse, you know, from the, that informatics, that political economy space? We already, we always already were though. Yeah. So I mean, for Illinois, I was the second black man to ever get a PhD from there. The School of Library and Information Science. They've been open now 115 years, mm -hmm. right? And so they're just not inclined to hear those voices. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I would argue too, even for digital and new media studies, this is still kind of transgressive in the ways in which I argue for trying to understand. I don't want to say the A word, affect, <laughs> right, and, and, and doing digital practice because I don't want to locate it as individual affect. I want to talk about structures of feeling, right, and I think I, I'm getting closer uh, every moment. And even still, this is not something that's automatically taken up, right. I will say there is hope. So my colleague, Sarah Florini, has the, her article is, which is really good. It's one of the few I complimented. I, it's one of the few I complimented in my book. Most people are just like, and eh, don't, don't read that shit. <laughs> <laughs> right, but her, her article is the, one of the larger sources for the Black Twitter article on Wikipedia. So it's not just that she's being cited. I think she should be cited more. But people who go to Wikipedia for Black Twitter, which I argue is undergrads and beginning grad students, are seeing her work. So possibilities forward maybe for expanding the ways in which we talk about uh, cultural cultural competence in black and digital practice. But mm -hmm. again, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're all in different departments. Yeah. 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 One, one of us in each one, though. Like, yeah. There is no mm -hmm. like commonsensical pre-existing home. Like, of course, yeah. you're in this traditional <coughs> thought. So we're all like, all over. Yeah. Come on, give it to me. I'm ready. Go for it. Um, I think I have a couple of questions. Okay. One is, I really like the idea of the libidinal, libidinal economy because it's outside of the kind of economic hegemonic mode. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not in communications, I've been doing a totally different study. Mm -hmm. But I have been really struggling with kind of believing that there is an outside mm -hmm. that isn't always being co-opted and appropriated mm -hmm. by the kind of, of hegemonic structures. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is one question mm -hmm. I have. Um, like, I want 
I want you to be right. I, I want <laughs> me you to help convince me. Um, and then the other one is I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the kind of negative, you know, the lynching watchers um, element of the Lib libido economy and how that, uh, what to do with that part of it. So the first part of your question, um, So I said earlier that every moment of my life is not structured by resistance, right? I'm not always pushing against the wind like my social media guy, right? Um, and I feel that even if eventually work becomes commodified or labor becomes commodified, I'm sorry, even if practice becomes commodified, that's the right word I should use, right? At the moment of its creation and perhaps even the sharing of it, it's not commodified in that moment. Right? It's not captured in that moment. It can become captured, but for much of the ways that black Twitter does its thing, and so Sarah and I were talking about this during our informal meeting, much of black Twitter is not available to the public gaze. It's not easily hashtagable and, and thus searchable. It's many more interactions between people. That stuff is not getting commodified in the same way. Yes, Twitter needs to make money, but they're not specifically pulling on a subset of black tweets to say, you know what, Cadillac, you should totally sell to these people. Or maybe they are, right? Even if they are, however, that moment of black joy is valuable in and of itself, right? So I'm, I'm not saying that they'll never be um, co-opted or appropriated or stolen outright, right? But I am saying, but in the in that moment of creation, when Peaches Monroe was in her car looking into her, her cell phone saying, my eyebrows are on fleek, she was not thinking of selling that to IHOP. Right? <laughs> or anybody else, right? So that moment of creation, that moment of invention is the part that I'm focusing on. I think we have to have a space where we can talk about the the pleasure of being, the pleasure of existing. And as far as I can tell, because I talked about as researchers, our own positionality where we make our bones off identifying moments of resistance and oppression in cultural industries, that's where we are focused, but that's not where the overwhelming mass of people in that moment are focused. And you need to be, I, I argue that I need to be attentive to that. The second part of your question, so I mentioned lynching photos. I probably could have updated because lynching is a really ugly, ugly subject. So Lisa Nakamura talks about glitch racism in a 2013 article, and she says that racism online is not a glitch. It's built in, baked into the system. Right. From that perspective, you can understand that whiteness has its own libidinal economies of technoculture, right? And some of that is other, right? And so again, going back to Du Bois, who I love, um, there's a, a scholar named Ann Rawls, and she talks about um, the ways in which whiteness does not, whiteness does not only sees the other in terms of its own self-image, mm -hmm. right? It does not allow, is not see the positionality of others. It's primarily focused on itself, right? From that perspective, you can understand why white. Uh, bad actors on the internet are understood as individuals, not as uh, symptoms of a wider collective. So racism online is bad actors who are racist, not a system-wide feature of the system, right? A system-wide feature of the, of the entire, the subset of services, the assemblage, right? Um, Kishana Gray's work on uh, griefing on Xbox Live is another great example. The ways in which gamers use race and uh, racism and misogyny to uh, play with other gamers, right? Um, Whitney Phillips' work on trolling is similar, right? I mentioned the lulls earlier, right? That's one of the things that when uh, people who are really intent put a lot of work into being online trolls, when they're interviewed, they say, well, you know, I was just doing it for the lulls. Well, what are the lulls? It's that affect of that structure of affect, the fact that they gain pleasure from giving other people grief, right? And so what to do about it? Like, this was a question I was asked earlier. There are ways in which you can build human communities that... Um, can address these things when they happen and shut them down. Uh, there are ways in which you can build computational and algorithmic means to combat these things. So many of you are familiar with the ways in which some of you are, well, this is old. I remember Java chat. Does anybody else remember Java chat here? And the ways in which you could not type certain curse words into Java chat, right? So there are algorithmic means by which you can stop the most blatant abuses of, of uh, incivility and the like. But there's still always going to be a next step because there will always be some jerk who wants to be a jerk in a space, right? And the system has to be flexible enough to allow that jerk to be jerky up to a certain point and then shut them down when it's not. So I don't know if there, there's a way to address it. I think it will always happen. The key is being aware of the ways in which people come to it 
and, and then trying to shut that down. So Riot, which runs a small game called League of Legends, has been really active in this space, right? And building in ways into the game itself of rewarding people who play nice, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And play fair. And those people, get th that, that tends to build in certain scaffolding to encourage a type of civil community. So I don't have the full answer, but those are examples that I can think of. Some y'all got? Really? I have another question, but I'm trying to like make room. Come on with it. I'm gonna wait as a good professor does. <laughs> 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 That's me. Okay. Uh, so, so why Barth? Um, you, you clearly like him. <laughs> uh, why, why him and not someone else from the from that same tradition? Why that tradition and not another one? So I don't understand Lacan, and I would not. <laughs> I, you know that Chomsky called him a charlatan. I can totally yes. believe that. Yeah. I, I would not have addressed Barth at all, but Sarah tra tra challenged me because I was like, I have no idea what to talk about. She challenged me because we had talked about this before: how to conceptualize Black Joy as digital practice, and so. Um, understanding Jewishance as eros as well as pathos and catharsis led me to this Brian Ott article and he is really thorough in his uh, exegesis of Barth. So I'm the ways in which he describes Barth are of value to me because Barth is explicitly concerned with reading a text, right? Where Leotard is not so much concerned. I don't know what the hell Leotard is concerned with, but he wants to talk about the libido. Right, but Barth makes it explicit in ways that I found really productive, especially given that Barth is and and Hot, for that matter, are very much pre-Twitter. The ways in which it maps on to the type of invention, and I keep coming back to that word as a rhetorician, right? The type of invention, the type of kairos that Black Twitter exhibits, and its playful uh, reorganization of signifiers and signified that mapped on perfectly to me. So I didn't like him before. I kind of I knew him from you know talking about mythology and certain things, his wrestling stuff, great stuff, um, but. <laughs> this particular project, this particular piece of the book is definitely Sarah Florini's fault. I'm going to hold her to that. <laughs> Sorry, that's a facile explanation, but um, Jewishness in particular is, is fascinating to me, uh, in part because I think libido economy, as your question pointed out, talks about more the exterior of political economies. Right, but it also doesn't necessarily map onto the way somebody feels. So one of my great beefs with my graduate students, first thing I say first day is, please don't come in to discuss this text by saying I liked it. I don't care if you liked it. Right, that's not really important or productive for this particular conversation. I want to know how it troubled you. Right, I want to know what made you intrigued by it. What made you not necessarily happy, but what made you passionate when you read it. And I think Jewish science really maps onto it well because it 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 talks about that violent excitement, and Barth talks about this as well. Um, when you're reading something that jolts you out of the space of reading to look up in the air and think of other ways in which you can apply this. Jewish science fits that perfectly. And so I'll probably keep them. I mean, I'll adopt them and take them home, feed them, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it, it was totally accidental, but I'm really glad that I ended up on this path. Did you have other work where you were going to be putting Du Bois and, and Barth in dialogue with one another? Ooh. Um, there's a piece that might not make it into the book where I talk about whiteness, um, specifically using Du Bois's um, discussion of the white world in Dusk of Dawn, because Du Bois has this lovely matrix where he talks about the qualities of a, white, um, a gentleman, a Christian, a white man, and an American. Right, and then talks about the various impulses and desires that try to that conflict and confuse the average white man as he tries to reconcile all these various strivings. And I think that's a great place to insert uh, both Leotard and Barth, right, to understand both Du Bois's textual strategy and making this evident, but also to talk about the ways in which whiteness is not just simply anti-blackness, although I love talking about it in that way because it makes people angry, right, but also that it's complicated, right, um, and in some ways this. Um, echoes a project I was working on earlier where I looked at this website called Stuff White People Like, mm -hmm. old, right? And Stuff White People Like was not necessarily interesting to me because he did this catalog of hipster Bloomington, Indiana English PhD students, but <laughs> <laughs> sorry, that is they weren't vegetarian, that was <laughs> right? That was but the comments, so I, I, I did a discourse analysis of the, this one entry on Obama, and at the time when I was writing on it in 20, 2009, 
2009, it had 11,000 comments. I looked at it again two years ago and it had 17,000 comments. For a, a blog post that's maybe 400 words that just mentions how much white people love Obama and what he means to them. But there's these comments, these lovely comments, some of them off topic because people are talking to one another, but many of them more saying, I'm not this kind of white person or this whiteness only exists in Iowa City, which is where I was faculty at the time, right? <laughs> I was like, really, Iowa City? Huh, strange, right? Um, and so the way in which it deconstructs the desires and pleasures of whiteness, but against this uh, arbitrarily set benchmark is fascinating to me, and I think Barth could be applied profitably to that. Thank you for making me think about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just had a quick factual question on your slide with hashtag black girl magic and the quote you had there. Is that something that was put on Twitter? Is that from Tumblr? You know she that? linked to it. It's on her Medium page. It's on her Medium page. It's very reminiscent of posts you see on Tumblr a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just wondered where it came, where it was first put. Tumblr is definitely the home of organic intellectuals. Mm -hmm. um, but. I would argue that she probably has a Twitter, uh, Tumblr presence as well. Uh, if nothing else, these uh, young folk <laughs> are multi-platform, right? Multimodal in the ways in which they express themselves. They can't be. They they can't do it any other way, right? So, all right, you ready, Marissa? Yeah. So I had a question about the grand socio-technical challenge, right? Is that we're um, often stuck as socio-technical researchers at this historical moment, right? Between letting go of structures and you know. But we're not quite ready to make that jump to post structuralism, like we're using that literature. But, and you know, so most, there are few socio technical researchers who also really understand racism and really study mm -hmm. it. I mean, so the problem is, right, um, that if we let go of structuralism, then we let go, we're, we risk letting go of the logic by which we explain structural racism, those institutions, right? Mm -hmm. But if we, we have to find some way to get people to understand at a theoretical level the connection between joy, you know, through social media. Yeah. You know, I study tribal people, right? So I'm thrilled to see this because like to make my work legible, I'll study activists. Yeah. But I'm really interested in the humor. Yes. Because that's the spirit they cannot kill. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So how do we um, sort of theoretically bridge these two different schools, different bodies of theorists, right? I mean, we have to we have to do that. We're, we have to fill that gap or else it, um, the work becomes sort of like, I don't know, we get stuck in these sort of Western European modalities of like, oh, we've, we're past that era, you know, of structuralism. Yes. We're post-racial, blah, 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 yes. right? The, the mob can arise and change society. And we're not gonna fall for that, right? On the other hand, um, we also, I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about this as well, I'm asking the question. I have not, I do, I am very careful about what I write about regarding Indian country because mm -hmm. I do not trust, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to let go of the strategies mm -hmm. for resilience and joy and endurance, mm -hmm. right? I don't want that to become co-opted by my CSCW colleagues. Yeah, I'll, if they ever see it. If they ever see it, yeah. So I don't know what you think about that, like theoretically, like what are, what's going on here theoretically? So second part first, um, in terms of the strategies, I am, well behind many of the accomplished journalists and advanced social media practitioners who function as explainers and online and, and media sites. So I'm thinking of Jamila Lemieux, I'm thinking of Kara Brown, I'm thinking of Ta-Nehisi, right? Uh, all these folk who spend a lot of time explaining what Black America is and does when they're doing these strategies of resistance, right, to wider audiences. Not necessarily to uh, profit off the misery or the strategies of black people, but simply because they want black people to be seen as human. There's a lovely post by a guy named Cord Jefferson who used to write for um, The All and um, Gizmodo, I believe. And he talks about writing on the race beat and his ongoing fatigue, what he calls racial battle fatigue, right? And having to write about yet another black death over and over again, right? So to me, that's the ultimate conclusion of what you're talking about. By, uh, uh, by attempting to... Um, discuss the humanity of the people that we're concerned with, we often run the risk of getting tired of having to discuss the humanity of the people we get over with. And I don't know if there's a way out of that problem. Like, I, 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 will, con I will continue explaining uh, racism to racists until I die, but it doesn't necessarily make me happy to have to do so. Uh, um, the first part of your question, I am not so much a post-structuralist. Remember I said me and Lacan, we not, 
Mm-hmm. Well, I'll see. Um, I am kind of in love with structura- structuration, right? Okay. With uh, Giddens structuration. And one of the reasons why I love them is he talks about late modernity. And mm-hmm. for him, the quality of late modernity turns on reflexivity, mm-hmm. right? And so I think that particular uh, way in which we think ourselves into being, the way in which we think around, think about the ways in which modernity has perhaps alienated us from nature and society, yet we still continue to function, that reflexive moment is the space that I think is the most productive to, to keep referring to structures of oppression, right, while looking forward to possibilities where those structures are becoming dismantled. You know, I notice I'm not saying that they will be, but perhaps they're becoming dismantled, right? Although, given that we're in Baroque Reconstruction, we can see that <laughs> sometimes they're erected twice as fast as they were <laughs> dismantled, right? And so, um, I don't know. And so, yeah, I, we should talk. Uh, I have not thought of myself as socio-technical, in part because I get frustrated by the social part, right? They want to, they, I feel like they want to overly focus on institutions and institutional processes at the expense of culture. So you and I should talk about how you work that out. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I'm coming at this from a slightly different angle. My background practice is in dance, um, but I find myself in a lot of these technical spaces trying to transcribe different sorts of practices that are fundamentally not really functioning in words at all anyway, yep. because it's, a, it's an embodied practice. Yep. Um, and, and I think this relates a little bit to the, the discourse that was just happening about this idea of trans, like transcribing practices, especially practices in academic spaces that don't really understand because it gets that there's like such a lossy a component to trying to fit into a certain sort of like academic discourse that there's so much lost in that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it becomes a sort of like constant playing game between trying to find ways of like in allowing for the work to speak in the way that we want it to speak but also trying to adhere to these sort of like very technical um, infrastructures of writing or, or speaking that we're supposed to do in order to be legible to a particular community, right? So I think this happens in multiple spaces. So I'm just curious from your perspective of like, how do you find yourself playing in that liminal space between those so that there is like that sort of the lived experience of what it is that you're trying to discourse around is present and feels like it's still there, but doesn't, doesn't lose people in that process and where do you like I feel like that's such an interesting sort of place of improvisation to use a dancer term and like how what does that exist for you where do you find support in the structure and where do you find that it like severely lacks that's a great question um some of the dance is visible in this uh, presentation like Sarah is my friend and my homie right so I know that I can come here and talk about nigger navy um, and people will giggle and laugh in this presentation. In other spaces, I wouldn't present it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, even though I am, like Marissa, I am very much more interested in the everyday life of the brown people that I study, right, than I am in the ways in which they are activists or political uh, people or even entrepreneurs, right? That part doesn't really concern me. I love watching it every day. And so mm-hmm. that quote by Le Peeves about hood black girls, I, I really love that part. And that made its way, the quote itself didn't make it away in the book, but the way of talking about a particular embodied black feminine aesthetic, but also black aesthetic made it into the book because I wanted to talk about that space. That being said, the description necessary to make that legible to academic spaces is so much writing, it could not fit into Mm -hmm. an article, right? Mm -hmm. And I've had this conversation multiple times with editors. They're like, you're writing about complex stuff, right? You want to talk about the semiosis of the interface and a critical discourse analysis of the people who are using the interface. Mm -hmm. That should be two separate articles. I'm Mm -hmm. like, the only way it really works is if you pull it together, right? right? And so I I mean, writing the book gives me a certain amount of freedom, although I lose the, the more rapid feedback. But it gives me a certain amount of freedom to play with this concept, right? And this is this what you see, what you've heard today is the direct result of having time to play with it. That being said, I'll never write a book again, um, <laughs> ever, right? This is hard work. Like I don't yeah. think of myself as a theoretical person. Mm-hmm. To go back to the other the, the, the other piece, though. Um, the problem with complex stuff is that it's complex, mm-hmm. right? And so the. Dance is to me a really, like dance professors always have the best questions because they are trying to do this translational effort, Mm -hmm. right? They are trying to make legible the movement of the body in space, the way it creates space and space works around Mm -hmm. it in a way that people can reward it with citations. As my friend says, (laughs) citations get you bitches, right? (laughs) Right? And so I I really appreciate the difficulty of your problem in part because doing the the black culture explainer thing that I do is fun for me, but I also know that 
I lose nuance in trying to explain it to yeah. to people in ways that they can grasp onto it with their limited, their short fingers, like <laughs> short finger Bulgarians. Uh, <laughs> so I, I really empathize with your position. I don't have an answer on how to address it other than keep working with the complexity. I don't even know if I could recommend technical tools because as, I, as you were talking, I was thinking, how could VR help the ways in which a, a choreographer could, I, to, to demonstrate the ways in which her art can be understood as um, interrogating this particular theory or position, right? And I'm like, but people would focus on what you did to get it in VR, not necessarily what it does in exactly. VR in the first place, right? And so I don't, yeah. No, it's, it's just helpful to hear like another writer's perspective, right? Like we all have these voices in which we're trying to transcribe. And I think it's really, really interesting because I feel like that's half the struggle, mm -hmm. right? Like, like conjuring the words is part of the struggle and like making them sound like legible, but also the way in which we organize it. It's another method, right? Yep. It's another algorithm yep. to use that sort of like technical term. It's, it's another way in which these infrastructures placate. It's one of the reasons it's why it's I love critical discourse analysis because it asks you to be narrative one, but also to respect the positionality of the people that you're talking about, their position mm -hmm. in the power structure, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, talking about the everyday is my respect of their particular power because they do have power. Even if we can't necessarily measure it, even if it's five million clicks on a Justin Bieber video, we can still talk about Justin Bieber as an object that people venerate for no particular reason, right? <laughs> <laughs> right, but that their, their presence as lurkers, as people clicking the thumbs up button is something that should be registered and given credit. Ms. Bambi. Um, one of the things that I, I loved your presentation. Thank you. Um, well, one of the things that I, I was noticing about it um, and, and having, you know, was a little in my feelings about it, yeah. um, was the way <laughs> that you are able to still engage, to engage these really complicated ideas, you know, really complex theory, mm -hmm. but still embrace the funny, mm -hmm. the humor. Uh, I mean, comedy's what I write about. That's, and, and one of the things that I get frustrated by, because, it, and I see there being a, a, a kinship with dance mm -hmm. in the improvisation, is a huge part of it, mm -hmm. reacting to the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I feel in this double bind because in some ways I want my work to be something that any intelligent person can pick up and read. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, well it's easier now that I'm tenured, but um, <laughs> but, but, you know, on the other hand, without a certain degree of, of higher theory, um, there's a way in which it, it loses, unless you're just doing, unless you're being a historian and not sort of a cultural, you know, doing this kind of cultural discourse analysis or, or looking at, it, it, they're, you know, because one of the things that I was noticing when you were doing this and, and connecting that with Bart is, is going back to the text. You know, it's always, when I, that's what I tell my students, when you're at a loss, go back to the text. Because the text is where you're going to find what you really want to talk about. And, and so it, it's, but, but part of that is, and I guess I'm asking how you're doing that in terms of, because translating the funny onto the page is really hard work. Mm -hmm. And, and um, nothing makes me matter than reading an article about comedy that is dry. dry. <laughs> 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 it's like you have, and, and that's why when you said joy, mm -hmm. You know, you have taken all the joy <laughs> out yeah. of this practice that's about eliciting laughter. You know, and, and and so I guess what I'm asking you is is something that I struggle with. You know, how how do you how do you balance it? You know, how do you um, 
because because I I am I am kind of the anti theory head. Mm. Um, so you say. <laughs> Oh, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you say. Right. And we all just saw what, what you, you did. did. Yeah. So, um, but, 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 you know, it, 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 but I, I'm, I'm sure, like, I mean, I've used double consciousness, too. Um, and, and, but it, it's sort of like, who, who do we want to talk to? Right. Right. You know, who, who is this, who is this kind of work for? And when we're we're talking about, you know, I, I love the, the fact that you're talking about the everyday. You're talking about the, this this casual interaction, um, and, and you know that's actually something that I want to move more towards, uh, rather than the comic writ large. Um, you know, not so much. Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle, but more Rob and Karen mm -hmm. for the Black Eyed Tips. The idea that there are these other spaces where there's kind of a different voice and a different vernacular that is reflecting on some of the same social and political issues, but does it in this kind of celebration of, I'm gonna say what I'm gonna say, and not worry about selling tickets. Mm -hmm or not worrying about whether HBO or Netflix or whoever is going going to buy the special. Mm -hmm. um, and um, not that that stuff isn't important too, because we were talking about the Mount, survival is a thing. Yeah. You know? And there are people who, W. Kim Bell, there are people who straddle. Mm -hmm. And I think he's one who really does, mm -hmm. but not necessarily a dig and not necessarily on. He's on Twitter and he's right. on Facebook, right. but, it's not but his, his but his spaces are podcasts. Yes, and, and so I guess we'll have to discuss this over lunch. <laughs> but um, but it, it's it. I think that just pedagogically, ideologically. Um, Spiritually, I feel like I'm always asking that question of who's this for? Mm -hmm. You know, it, it could because I think, I mean, we've all been, we, not all, but we've been to SEMS where you sit in the back and hear someone saying, Who are you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> and what relevance does this have Indeed. to anything on the planet? Indeed. SCSW, I mean, yeah. CSCW too. That's like that too. Like, and, who, who is this for? and so it, it's because I yeah, and I, I think there's this tie between seeing scholarship as teaching mm -hmm. that that's at least to me is an important part of it mm -hmm. because um, I don't know. I'm blathering now. I'll be quiet. <laughs> so a couple of different things. Um, this performance is very much performance, mm -hmm. right? Um, I can play to the crowd. I mean, it's one of my gifts. I'm a decent public speaker, right? So I can play to the crowd and structure things in ways that try to add some levity to dense discussions of structuralist theory, <laughs> right? And, and discourse analysis, which is not fun by any stretch. It does not necessarily translate to my written work, although the book is better than others because I have the space. And this is what I was going to say. One of the things that I would love to encounter in Barth or Leotard is the idea of the absurd as part of Jewish songs, right? The way, and so they do talk about it a little bit, right? The ways in which you are jolted out of your subjectivity. I think good comedy is that which jolts you out of your subjectivity or makes you reconsider your relationship to your subjectivity, right? And so those to me are the funniest comics, right? They, they make you think about the, the world in different ways that perhaps elicit a chuckle or at least, if nothing else, and I'm thinking of Carlin, at, at least make you think, hmm, right? And I think that's as much a part of Jewish songs as anything else. For uh, Black Twitter in particular, um, the fact that it is so brief requires an inordinate amount of explanation. And I always get frustrated when I see presentations on Black Twitter that assume that because people know what Twitter is and the person that's writing, that's giving the presentation or writing the article has used Twitter, that that's what Twitter is. They don't do any additional explanation of the context that's necessary to understand any tweet that comes forth, right? And so I try in my work to be thorough. So 
here I'm talking about discourse historical method, so uh, Wodak's discourse analysis. Right? I try to be thorough and, and giving as much context as I can. So like the example with the uh, red cup gift. I try to give you as much context mm -hmm. as you can so you can understand. One, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting moment to have picked up on. It's random as hell. But then to take that random moment and assign it to things that we all have perhaps felt frustration about, that to me can, that it illustrates moments of genius maybe, mm -hmm. creativity for sure. Right, and so that can be done in this presentation. In my Black Twitter uh, research article, which has been cited far too many times, it's kind of embarrassing, right? But I tried to describe a hashtag called New TV One Shows. Right? <laughs> Who knows what TV One is in here, right? And so I tried to explain why, and I tried to do this in job talks too. I tried to explain why people on Black Twitter thought it was important to build, to fantasize about what new shows on TV One, a black television network, would be, right? And my favorite one is We Don't Need No Pumpkin Pie. <laughs> So y'all laugh immediately. Y'all get that, right? But trying to explain it in print, when I even when I give this presentation, like I tried to mention this at Microsoft, and, and one person was like, well, what's wrong with pumpkin pie? Like, oh. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And so it just requires so much explanation that it kind of sucks all the fun. Like if you have to explain a joke to somebody, it's no longer funny. Right? No. It's almost the same with Twitter. If in the course of explaining it, it almost becomes not nearly as funny as it could have been, which is why many people resort to showing streams of tweets or multiple tweets, and I cheated and I did that too, right? Because then you can gain a uh, idea of the collection of absurdity that built up around this particular topic right uh, so it's it's I would argue it's damn near impossible unless we're doing multimedia presentations but I argue that if I did a multimedia presentation like a Prezi right with tweets you would be so distracted by the motion and the per trying to make the connections visually and uh, semantically between the tweets that I was showing it would still be incoherent so I'm back to explaining um, okay that's all I got well, unless anybody has one more quick thing, then I would like to thank Dr. Brock. Thank you, all for thank you for coming at the end of the semester. That's freaking awesome. <laughs> thank you, everyone.